Hello, the internet. Welcome to Open Source Directions, hosted by Open Teams, the webinar that brings you all the news about the future of your favorite open source projects. I'm a Deacon Monk, and I'm excited to be the host for this episode of Open Source Directions. I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I work on the YT projects, and I'm based in Urbana, Illinois. Shocker. Coasting with me today is... Hi, hi, everyone. My name's Henry Badry, and I'll be your co-host for today, this episode. I recently moved from Sydney, Australia to Austin uh, to join Open Teams as the growth marketer, so that's very exciting. And while I'm still a newbie in open source, I'm very excited for this episode. So on that note, I'd like to introduce our amazing guest for the episode, Eric. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric, and I do research at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I work in a team called Scientific Data Analysis. It's technically part of IT. We're simultaneously a special ops team and a spare tire for our <laughs> colleagues. Um, if we want to talk about that in another setting, I'm happy to do so as well. Um, my current specialty is to bring Bayesian machine learning and statistics to our you know, work in biomedical research and my manager's frequentist, but we get along pretty well. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for introducing yourself, uh, Eric. Now, before we dive too much into the meat of the episode, let's go to our famous tweet of the week section, where each of our panelists presents a tweet that they've been enjoying recently. Eric, what do you have to share with us today? Definitely. So. Tweet that I have one, is one that's communicating math in a reader-friendly fashion. Um, so you have tweets that look like this, uh, um, and inside there, the, the key point being is like equations are very, very abstract. So making concrete what the terms are in the equation is really good. Even better if we can like pair the equation with a equation, because then that really makes it like come home for uh, those of us who are programming types. Yeah, this seems like a really nice way to also explain to somebody who doesn't necessarily understand the syntax of the math as well, um, you know, to understand the physical application that the equation is sort of applying to. Um, okay, uh, what do we have next? So yeah, my tweet of the week is something a bit different, but I stumbled upon it and I thought, okay, it's kind of creepy, but kind of interesting <laughs> that find, is this new functionality with the AirPods. So essentially, if you turn on, uh, you go to your settings and you go to control center, you can turn on hearing aid uh, kind of thing for your AirPods. And say, if you leave your phone in the room and you go to a different room, but you still have your AirPods in, you can hear what is being said in that room um, based off your phone. So that's what that was something to share. And if any of anyone wants to use that out there, maybe they can, um, but just something a little bit sneaky. Yeah, definitely sneaky. Uh, <laughs> um, I also saw in like the answers for this that you could use it as a walkie talkie, which seems yeah. kind of cool. Um, that seems like a really interesting feature. Uh, so for my tweet of the week, I'm a little biased here. Some of you know I'm into Viz. So this is something that came up last week uh, in related to the YT project, which is the project I work on. And this is uh, image that is composed of four different fields from simulation data. Um, and so this person used YT to visualize each field and then stitch them together using image magic. And I just think it's such a beautiful visualization. I really love how the fields fade together and you can see how in the same region of the data, you can see how they kind of how different the fields uh, can be visualized. So I don't know, I found it really fun. That's something you could definitely just put on a big poster and check on your wall. I know, yeah. Some people have such cool simulation data and I'm incredibly jealous because uh, <laughs> not, sometimes, you know, you just have to do like yeah. a 2D plot and it's, you know, it might be interesting, but it's not as beautiful. Like it's not as artistic, yeah. right? So. The colors always bring it out. Right, it's true. And good color maps as we all know, right? Um, okay, well, so now that we've talked about the tweet of the week, mm -hmm. let's dive a little bit more into PyJanitor. So PyJanitor is a project that extends the pan pandas with a verb-based API, providing convenient data cleaning routines for repetitive tasks. 
You can find uh, the source code uh, for PyJanitor at github.com slash ericmjl slash PyJanitor. It has 470 stars on GitHub as of this morning. And uh, across PyPI and Conda, it has about 2,000 downloads a month. Awesome. Yeah. Now, Eric, it's very, very interesting because it obviously is a very uh, topical thing now with AI and machine learning, data cleaning. Everyone knows how much of a pain it can be. So I'm interested to know why was the project started and then what need does it feel mm -hmm. in your opinion? Yeah, definitely. So um, I basically found myself using pandas pretty heavily in grad school. And then when I started working, realized that, you know, I'd been doing the same data cleaning routines over and over and writing code over and over that was essentially doing stuff that I did in a previous project. But one thing that I didn't have much experience with back then was uh, putting stuff together into a Python package that, you know, could distribute and then let other people use. So, and I also didn't realize how, uh, how common some of these data cleaning um, functions might have been across other people's work too. So it's just sort of like, uh, I had these things, I knew how to do it, they were all in my head, but I didn't know that it could be useful to other people. So then when a colleague at work showed me the R janitor package, that's when a light bulb just like went off. And it was like, oh yeah, this guy made this package uh, janitor and he's sharing functions that he's used for the whole R data frame dplyr world, maybe you should do the same for, for pandas. So then, um, yeah, maybe you should have shared a shared library that puts a bunch of data cleaning and processing routines into a single package that we can distribute so that more people can benefit. So initially, I just started like porting over the R package functionality. And I remember the one that I first started with, which was the clean names function, which does a one and one very specific thing. It makes all of your names, uh, column names in a, a data frame um, in a clean format. And that is to say, it's got no spaces, got no special characters. You can access those column names with a data frame dot something attribute syntax that pandas uh, enables us to do. And so it also seemed to be the one that really scratched a niche with many people because it received a lot of attention. There's a lot of people that made contributions to that as well. So in any case, like, the, the need that the project fills is basically a library of common data cleaning functions that we might all need at some point in our projects. And, you know, like basically functions that would wrap two to seven lines of commonly used, commonly written pandas code uh, that now we can method chain and read off as like a single step in our data cleaning routine. Now, apart from that, it also serves one other need. And this is a need that I've been trying to, uh, this is a point that I've been trying to promote at work more. Um, data scientists write code, right? I write code and writing code equals to writing software. And writing software means at some point, I'm definitely going to need to organize it, document it, and mm -hmm. test it because someone else is gonna be looking at my Jupyter notebooks. So all of those correspond to uh, software engineering practices <laughs> basic software engineering practices. A janitor solves a need for me in that like I can practice being a software engineer so that I can be more effective in my day job as a data scientist. Awesome. I loved hearing the story of how it progressed. And also, you know, I it's amazing to kind of reflect on how much of the SciPy and PyData stacks have been influenced by grad students having to solve problems for their data, right? Um, I definitely wrote some very um, not amazingly useful code for grad school, but you know, it's what really got me into software and finding all the tools to help me visualize my data. So it's really cool to hear that you kind of had this moving forward as well. Um, yeah. So I was looking over um, your documentation, yeah. you have this really cool logo and the kind of scripted name on your documents. Can you tell me the history and the name uh, of the name and the logo? Yeah, definitely. So as I mentioned just now, it's a mm -hmm. port of the R package janitor. So the name is quite natural that we you know, import it as janitor. 
but someone else had another package registered on PyPy as janitor. So we had to go with PyJanitor. Otherwise it would have been Python janitor. And you know, the R world is good with making puns <laughs> and in Python, we're not really that good. We just do Py something. So yeah, all right. So I'll just call it PyJanitor. Now, um, recognize, I recognize though, like this, this is a copycat pack package. So um, in a nod towards the R community. So there are gonna be some R users who are now embedded in a Python primary or a primarily Python environment. And so if they've used the janitor package, you know, coming over to the Python world, I've tried to make sure that there's some form of parity between the Python version and the R version. Um, and if it's not possible, right, where there's some, you know, there's some things that Python can't do, um, it, uh, like non-standard evaluation, for example. That means some functions can't be re-implemented exactly in the same way in in Python. Then in those cases, we we go and um, we sort of default to how do we make the code readable, right? With all of the arguments readable, so you can just sort of read off something like uh, transform column. This is the starter column. That's mm -hmm. the function. That's the destination column, right? That's sort of how we how we approach that. Um, now for the logo, it's really cool. Um, the logo came out like this. It's, it's one of community mm -hmm. collaboration. So this is PyCon 2019. Uh, I wanted to lead a sprint for PyJanitor. So I went up on the sprint stage and said, all right, we're leading a sprint, uh, it's data cleaning routines. And if you like, if you work with pandas and you wanna make life easier for other pandas users, come to the sprint room. Um, and so I put up a sprint uh, and it was really cool because there's like about 20, 20 odd people who came by, um, and, uh, we got a lot done that sprint, but in order to make sure that people could find out which, like which of the sprint rooms we were in, I needed to have this like big humongous thing that would be iconic. So I drew a <laughs> broomstick just like, like this <laughs> on a 3M, 3M sticky pad. <laughs> And it was a, it's a completely <laughs> ugly broomstick. Actually, some people said it looks more like a rocket than a broomstick, rocket taking off. So, but, but it served the purpose, right? So, so during the sprint, one of the contributors, he had just finished the pull request and he was waiting for the build to complete. So he, he looked at that logo. I was like, Luke, Lucas looked at, Lucas, Lucas Kushner is his name. He, whipped, he looked at the logo, whipped out his tablet and like took a photo of it and then just started digitizing it. Then he made a second PR, and the <laughs> PR title was adding the beautiful new logo to the documentation, and that's how we that's have it. I hope this person. Good, good start somewhere. Yeah, I hope they're a contributor forever. That's, that's an it. amazing contribution to the project. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love yeah. that story. <laughs> yes. It's awesome. Uh, so, are there any alternative projects out there? Yeah. So for the alternative projects, uh, there were quite a lot. And a lot of it stemmed from uh, Pandas users who used to be our users who wanted dplyr. Um, and we saw a bunch, right? There's pdply, uh, dfply, plydf. They're all some variants of that name. Um, we detailed a lot about the uh, uh, related projects in our SciPy con conference proceedings paper. And so that link can probably go into the chat in a moment. Um, so there's a lot of detail there, but the main finding was everybody tried to replicate the pipe syntax and tried to replicate dplyr, but then nobody was putting together all these convenience functions. Um, and plus we also know one thing that I mean, yes, R has the pipe syntax, which is very idiomatic, but in Python, the idioms are to do method chaining if you wanna do something that's similar to piping. So uh, we chose a design, uh, well, we sort of evolved it that way. We evolved the design towards um, using method chaining and then verbs for names, which is again, a thing borrowed from the R world uh, and then decided, well, that's that's how we'll do it. And then now it's it's grown into a, a community collection, really, of data Yeah, thanks functions. for explaining that. Um, can you tell us, like you've kind of hinted at some packages that it's related to a little bit, but can you tell us what technology PyJanitor is built on? 
Yeah, definitely. So uh, the primary thing that makes PyGenitor work, uh, especially with like method chaining of functions that are that look like they're native to a data frame, that's made possible by using Pandas Flavor. So it's made Pandas Flavor is a package by Zach Saylor, Zachary Saylor. And I think if I remember correctly, last time we chatted, uh -huh. he's still part of the Jupyter team. And the key idea of that package is that we can design functions that take a data frame as the first argument and return a data frame. And then we can dynamically monkey patch those functions onto a data frame at runtime. And so suddenly, uh, transform column, which is not a native pandas data, uh, data frame class method, now can behave as if it is a data frame method. So you can do df.transform column, and because it returns a data frame, you can then uh, chain on another transform column or an, a rename column or a clean names, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm aware that the pandas devs prefer namespaces. So they prefer that we do something like df.janitor.something. Yeah. But if you think about it, if I have seven janitor functions and I need to keep writing .janitor.function, it's much more work than just writing df.function. So, um, it's with that design that we decided not to approach, not to adopt the, the, the namespacing because the intent here is that we're going to continually method chain and you know compose pandas native and uh, janitor native functions together. Now, so that's that's the key core of how the uh, how this works. Um, there are some extensions that have been made. Uh, and they are for the X-Array and PySpark data frames. Um, those are two packages that, due to the nature of my work, I don't use much. So actually, other people have uh, made those contributions. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're a fledgling like sub-library right now. I can't wait to see them like graduate and become independent libraries on their own. So I'd love to see more users port, port stuff over to work with these other data frames. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a, one thing I think for anyone watching, if you're not a contributor already, definitely have a look at the GitHub page and see if you can help out. Uh, so were you the person who started or who started PyJanitor, Eric? Yeah, so um, so first off, like I, I can't introduce who created PyJanitor without first introducing the original creator of Janitor, the R package. So his name is Sam Firk. I think he lives out in the Midwest as well. Uh, avid biker as well. Um, he's the original, and I'm the we're the copycat serving Python people. All right, just to make sure. All right. Um, so I showed the uh, so so then what happened? The, the uh, a little brief history of how that how it came to be. Uh, a colleague showed me on his laptop. Hey, look at this! And he found the R janitor package. Then I saw the clean names function in the R janitor package. I was like, huh, I can re-implement that. So then like we implemented it and that's sort of how it just got started with one humble function that everybody ends up using. Um, and then it grew. I showed it to a colleague uh, in at work and he took to it just like that because he loved the method chaining paradigm. Um, and soon after, after I started tweeting a little bit about it, uh, people from all over the States and the world started like using it uh, and that was that was for me a very uh, interesting and gratifying yeah, experience. Yeah, um, and it's also fun to get responses from people when you hear what they're doing, and if they do something totally different with the package you developed, it's it's such an amazing feeling. Um, and I want to remind our listeners right yeah. now that you know right now we're talking a little bit about, about PyJanitor, and we're going to go in the roadmap discussion a little bit more about where you can contribute. But if you are hearing things that interest you and you have any questions, please post them in the question section of the uh, on the right hand side of the webinar. Uh, we'll ask some of your user questions at the end of the episode in the Q&A section. So please ask questions, anything that's interesting you or, you know, anything related to PyJanitor, uh, please add them to the question section. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about uh, who started the project. Can you tell us who maintains the project right now? Because um, you talked a little bit about all the contributors, but is, you know, where, where, what is the difference here? Yeah, definitely. 
So uh, the maintainers come are drawn from the contributor pool. So mainly it's myself plus uh, a bunch of other people. And there's actually some I've never met in person, but I've given them commit rights to the repository because they've, they've been really good. So the way I decide to give commit rights is basically someone who has, uh, uh, well, okay, so maybe I'll back up a little bit. Commit rights, we give it to people who contributed in uh, a diversity of ways. So I, I'm not only code contributors, right? So, um, and I'm always looking for a community of people to help, right? So um, an example of like some of the, the, the contribute, uh, some of the maintainers, um, one is one pair, JK and Sally, they're a Korean American husband and wife team. And they actually came to both SciPy and PyCon sprints last year. So like they were, they really helped out a lot, um, especially after their first, like they first joined uh, at PyCon and then they came to SciPy and I asked them, could you help me monitor the PRs? And then because I needed them to say like, just, just merge as soon as you see them pass, I gave them commit rights. And then they also helped out other, other ways at the sprint as well. But th that was the, the catalyst for me giving them commit rights. And then there's another colleague, Zach, Zach Barry. He's a colleague of mine. He helped lead the uh, SciPy sprint. He's the one who really took to it and uh, helped with the X-ray extensions. Um, so he's in Cambridge with me. Um, Hector is a grad student in California. Uh, and we've actually done more stuff together beyond just uh, um, talking about PyGenitor. So he uh, he's in the bioengineering field. That used to be my old life. And when he wrote a paper, I, I sort of like did a pre-peer review trying to see whether, where, uh, you know, reviewer number two would shoot down the paper. Um, so yeah. Uh, just tried to like make the paper as, as robust as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we make friends that way. Um, there's Shan, uh, Shan Do. Uh, she lives in Northern California and she helped a lot with the documentation. Um, in fact, there was one thing that I, I just learned about last year called semantic line breaks. Um, and writing with writing documentation in plain text with semantic line breaks really helps with the maintainability of the written docs, mm -hmm. you have you minimize line changes when ideas change. So it's really cool. Um, there are two people, uh, Zijie and Paul. Uh, one's in I think Singapore, Southeast Asia for sure, and the other in California. Uh, Paul is an ex Caltech grad student, if I remember. They they help a lot with designing the PySpark extensions. And there's right now I think one or two functions that have been ported over. Uh, and as more contributors decide they might want this, then Totally, I'm happy to see that grow in. And then, of course, uh, can't forget Sam Zuckerman. He's actually of of everybody uh, that I've listed so far. Uh, Zijie and Sam have not met in person ever, but they are the two that also have commit rights to the to the repository. So Sam helped out a lot early with code and docs, and uh, he is, I think, a bit better as a software engineer than than I am. So I actually learned stuff from him too. Um, so <clears throat> he was also like, I think the first to propose putting in-depth examples into the documentation. So at first we did an experiment with like Sphinx style, mm -hmm. long documentation. Um, but then it would, it, it got hard to maintain the consistency of the docs across functions. So, uh, I hope he's not too offended by this, but I commented them out, but, and, but then Mark left them in the source code so that anyone else who wants to port them over to a Jupyter notebook, which I think is the better setting for this. Um, uh, they can, we can, we can get some help. Like I, I left them in there so that there's help, that there's an easy path to porting it over. Um, and, but then that, that said though, he did kickstart a bunch of good practices in the, in the project. And I'm really thankful. That's to him amazing. For, yeah. It's really great to well. hear people when you give this recognition, because I just think that we, one thing at open teams we believe is that it's just not given out in the open source community. And that's why I really love when you said that it isn't just the lines of code that you write really that, that show a contribution, like most work on open source projects, isn't coding. It's, it's other things. So it's really great to hear that. Yeah. Um, that's something we're trying to solve or a problem we're trying to solve at open teams. And so you previously mentioned that you were, you were flabbergasted because you had all these users from around the world. Um, but what communities are your users yeah. and uh, contributors from? Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, there have been, so uh, contributors have come from all over the place. Uh, 
primarily the ones that have contributed more heavily are are the so most of the work has been happen happening at the conference sprints so PyCon and SciPy the mm -hmm. two sprints that was where a lot of development and documentation work happened um, and those people came from all sorts of organizations uh, those contributors came from all sorts of organizations some were grad students some were uh, working software engineers in fact I think there's someone from Bloomberg who wrote in who put in a few mm -hmm. few lines of code in there uh, and and their their colleagues took a photo and asked if they could like tweet about it. I was very happy about that. Um, uh, there's and as I mentioned, you know the, the the contributors come from all over the place. One thing I know that I've been conscious of uh, not putting any tracking code inside there. Um, so mm -hmm. definitely that makes it a little harder to yeah. uh, know where people are using using it. But hopefully, you know, uh, I'm yeah. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully it's being put to good use. Um, definitely the the use of the statistics from the downloads on Conda and PyPy, if there's geostats, geo, geospatial stats on there, I'd, I'd be happy to look at it. But, you know, most of the time I've, I've just found, I guess the things that matter don't really have to be counted. So <laughs> if, if people find a good use for it, stars on GitHub are more than enough for me. And you definitely have some good stars on GitHub. So that's, uh, <laughs> it's great, you know. Um, and kind of to echo what Henry was saying, it's really nice that you uh, include people who contribute not just code um, to be maintainers of the project and give them commit rights. Uh, you know, it allows people mm -hmm. to be able to contribute who maybe don't, you know, aren't as comfortable with code or uh, maybe just want to get their feet in wet a little bit with documentation, you know, people who, you know, it's like all different people. So that's really nice. And so related to that, mm -hmm. um, is the code mm -hmm. participating in any diversity and inclusion efforts? Because this is certainly an inclusive sort of thought process. Right. Um, so not officially, but I've been influenced quite heavily by like uh, being part of the PyMC developer mm -hmm. group. Uh, where they're part of NumFocus and NumFocus has its own ish initiatives and the likes. Um, the reason it's not official is because this this project really is a federated side project for all of us. So there's no official affiliations for the project and therefore no official participations right. in anything. Um, we haven't even done like Google Summer of Code <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, my my guess is since. Since the repo is under my name, I probably have some unofficial benevolent dictator for life powers. So whatever intersectional axes you can think of where we can uh, I mean, the, the, definitely I recognize the gender balance on the, this, um, uh, those who have commit rights is, is skewed. So I've been looking um, carefully for like more contributors, but definitely I'm not, I'm not forcing things. Mm -hmm because it's a volunteer driven project. And so it's up to those who have, I guess, the time and the willingness to, to make, a, make an impact. Knowing, however, like, I do have to clarify this too, right? It's like knowing that it doesn't all have to be code because mm -hmm. I think sometimes uh, new contributors are a little intimidated by the fact that mm -hmm. you have to be a coder, right? Or the, sorry, the perception that you have to be a coder to contribute to an open source project, yeah. definitely not, right? Like that, I, I would love to, see more contributions that are non-code, um, mm -hmm. like writing docs. Um, one thing that was really, really cool, um, uh, if you remember Shan and a few other, who is one of the uh, main, uh, those who have commit rights to the repository, she and a few other people actually took the time to sit down and write out first contributor docs, like how do you get set yeah, up right. with line by line um, awesome. instructions uh, with, how, yeah. Um, with even uh, a, a, a section contributed by someone who is a PyCharm user on how to get set up with PyCharm mm -hmm. and Conda environments and how to make them talk with, it's not even supposed to be specific to the PyJanitor project, but they sat down and they wrote it together. And that really helped, helped me a lot when I was leading the sprint and it helped other newcomers come to the sprint and be less intimidated because about 60 to 70% of first timers to the project can solve most of their uh, environment setup issues just by following mm -hmm. that set of docs. Um, and so I was very thankful for that because I don't know how to, yeah. I've forgotten how to be a beginner. 
Uh, I certainly think it's a bias for so many uh, maintainers of open source projects, you know, and you forget some of those workflows that you shift over to, um, you know, especially like going from beginner to maybe somebody who's a little more intermediate. And so that sounds like such an invaluable contribution to the docs. And I, you know, it's great. That is super inclusive to beginners. That's really nice. It's very uh, important. I find just over talking with contributors or even people who have programming skills and want to get into open source, there's just so many barriers. And so by having that uh, first contributor file, Mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic. And I think you can put tags on your GitHub issues to say they might be beginner friendly. I think it's just really breaking down these barriers and and giving a way for these first timers to feel comfortable coming in because it's, Imagine just walking into a school or walking into just a large project room and just sitting down and being like, I'm, I'm going to help in this way. This is how what I'm going to fix. No one really does that for their first time. And so really right. the only difference is that we're doing it all remotely and that you never really meet the person. So I think it's definitely breaking down those barriers yeah. is, is a fantastic way. So that's great to hear. So now we're going to, sh- yes, Thanks that's lot. true. So now we're going to shift into the project demo where we'll get to see some of the cool features of PyJanitor and how it works. So Eric, while Eric's getting set up here, uh, we'd like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsor, Quantsight, for sponsoring this episode of Open Source Directions. Quantsight, creating value from data. So with that, Eric, when you're ready um, and you've got your screen shared, take it away. Okay, dokes. Let me see. Can you all see my screen here? Uh, yep. I think this is yes, yep, the correct one. Yep, we can one. see your screen. Okay. You might want to make it a yeah. little bit bigger, I so, think. Definitely, definitely. So. That looks good. Oh, so how does the font size look now? Great. Okay, so I've got um, up here a bunch of notebooks, two notebooks primarily that I will show. Uh, these come from the Jupyter Notebook examples that are part of the PyGenitor documentation. So in case you're curious, um, the URL for the PyGenitor docs is pygenitor.readthedocs.io. And if you go to examples, um, there's a whole bunch of like Jupyter Notebooks that have been converted to Sphinx docs that you can look at to see how how to use certain functions and, and the likes, right? So in my case, in, just for today, I'm gonna showcase two notebooks, which I think give a flavor, a pretty good flavor for uh, how things, how, how, the, um, how the syntax of the project works, right? So first off, we have this notebook that talks about this function called group by ag. Um, and the way that, the way that group by ag works is, is it, it says, let's say I got a, a data set that looks something like this item MRP and number sold, but I want to attach as a new column, the average MRP for shoes to the shoes rows and the average MRP for the bags to the bag rows, right? Um, if you were to do this with regular pandas, my guess is you might do something like, uh, let's see, I'm doing this live, df.group by item dot ag um, average MRP is equal to uh, MRP and then you do mean and then you'd have something like that now so grouped means is equal to that and then you'd have to do back df dot merge group uh, sorry dot merge grouped means dot reset index. Uh, I think that should get you to where we're supposed to be. Yeah, there we go. Shoo, 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 bag, bag. And that's, that's, that's pretty much how we would do it, right? But that's two lines, which is probably one line too many for what I'm interested in writing. So um, someone who is lazy enough in their day to day, and I mean lazy <laughs> and the Bill Gates kind of, uh, I want to hire lazy people kind of lazy. Um, someone who's lazy enough in their uh, day-to-day actually put in a group by ag function that allows us to, to perform that operation. So if we do, first off, uh, actually, so here's, here's by the way, the, the clean names function, that famous mm-hmm. starting point. So if you notice now the uh, item, like this, this is, this is mm-hmm. the, the column names have changed and they're, this one is like all lowercase. That's the effect that clean names does. Um, and if we do a group by ag, 
yes, I said it's more lines of code, but it's a lot easier to read. You group by the item, you aggregate by mean, you aggregate over MRP and you create a new column name for that. And then suddenly they're all there. And we also have the added bonus in that um, the original order is actually preserved. So there's a little bit of magic that went in underneath the hood. And that's, that's one example of a convenient data cleaning function that uh, we, we now have as part of our toolkit. Um, and one thing that I do remember, do encounter a lot when I'm doing Bayesian statistical modeling is that if I have an item that is categorical, usually I might, if I'm say fitting a linear mixed effects model or you know doing some hierarchical modeling, uh, I need these um, string terms to be encoded as integers so that I can group and index things correctly. And what you might do is you might bust out, oh, let's get the scikit-learn label encoder. I mean, sure, write four more lines of code, but what if you could just do label dot label encode and get them all done oh, cool. like that? So that's sort of like a convenience. Again, it's all about mm -hmm. convenience, right? Like it's it's uh, and and putting in verbs as names, so group by ag, clean names, mm -hmm. group by aggregate, and then label encode this particular column and get back in named column right that is that, that that's sort of like the whole mantra behind here so that's one example um, the other quick example that I'll show is actually an example that I copied directly over from the R package so once again this is sort of like uh, uh, like once again like this is the copycat the R package is the original so you have this like Excel file and I know I'm going to sound like a snob saying this, but like Excel is horrible, especially if you deal with the biosciences. Gene names get oh, clobbered no. by Excel. Don't use Excel. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but also, if you use Excel, you can get users who do crazy things like this. They keep an entire column that is empty and an entire row that is empty just for the sake of visually separating things. Um, but tabular data, if we Tabular data was never right. really meant to be like that, right? So there are some things that are that we might want to do with the data frame that would help us figure out, like help us clean the data conveniently, right? And so in this example, the famous clean names function comes in. Um, it still it 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 looks for a certain subset of special characters, but then some of them it might it might still do uh, it still might um, preserve over there. Uh, so, but as a first approximation, the, the column names are already a little better. Now, there is a function that, again, ported over from the R package called remove empty that removes this do not edit and removes row number seven. Um, so if you do that, then uh, it removes that empty row and then re-indexes everything correctly and that like do not edit column is suddenly gone. It was previously in between mm -hmm. full-time and certification. And so now between full-time and certification, we don't have it. Then there's renaming columns. Um, usually if you wanted to rename a column in Pandas, you do uh, df.rename and then you need to do a axis. But because this is explicitly rename column, we sort of just wrap that in a convenience function that you can just call, right? Um, so. You know, rename columns, or if you're a little bit more, uh, but if you if you instead wanted to mix and match this with uh, pandas native function, which is totally possible, you can do something like rename, and then you pass in a dictionary percent allocated, um, percent allocated, uh, etc., and then axis is equal to columns. If I remember the API correctly, so one thing about the PyGenitor project is that we we try not to clash with native pandas so you actually can mix and match very easily pandas function names alongside uh, pandas class methods sorry alongside janitor functions which have been monkey patched as uh, that's, data frame that's class so methods. nice yeah so um one thing i want to say eric is that we're running a little is. behind so if you can show maybe like one more highlight okay. and then we'll go into the roadmap so we get time to talk about where you want to go with the project definitely I like this one, okay. convert Excel date. Um, and it's something that converts that thing that was a clobbering of the Excel date into the right the right thing. Um, and in fact, I think uh, Felipe Fernandez, who is uh, one of the Condor Forge maintainers, 
he contributed a few other things, which were like convert Unix date, convert some other date, because he had to do that. Uh, and so he helped a lot, like just getting conversion of dates into into the package too. So that was really nice. And now Great. we have a data frame. Success. Also. And dates are such a challenge Hooray. when you're doing a data frame operation or any type of operation in Python. I don't know. It's like such a headache. So, so now we're gonna yeah. so now we're gonna move into the they roadmap totally discussion. Another fun segment of this webinar where we'll talk about where PyGenitor mm -hmm. is going and future directions that'll be taking. For those of you who are mm -hmm. listening, these items are places that mm -hmm. PyGenitor is going to be looking for code or funding or people to participate in the project. Um, those are all things that PyGenitor would like mm -hmm. to see happen moving forward. So with that, Eric, can you tell me about what directions you want to see PyGenitor go, uh, what things, you know, what new features it could have, things like that? Yeah, definitely. So the first thing that I'm hoping to see is more people contributing examples, um, particularly if you're not using it in work. Like, seriously, if you use a PyGenitor for work, keep your proprietary stuff proprietary. But if you're going to, if you use PyGenitor for work and you have some spare time and, and you do some side projects um, with that use data cleaning methods, um, I'd love to see them as like examples in the uh, uh, examples directory because uh, that is a great way to show people how the package gets used. So one, one particular thing that I'm hoping to see is more contributions of examples. Um, of how the package is used. The other part then, and, and part of it then is um, one thing I've recognized is like, it's still stuck to my username right now. And I'd like that to be more like PyMC3 where it's stuck under a PyMC devs uh, GitHub organization rather than my own personal user username. That said, there's a bunch of stuff that's sticky right now. So like the uh, continuous integration systems all under my account. PyPy is all under my account. If I get hit by a bus, um, someone else has to take oh, no over. no bus factor. Touch wood. I don't want that to happen. No bus, no bus factor. Oh, what a uh, <laughs> That's what I'm here for. So I, yeah. so I definitely want to keep the, one thing I do want the project to stay on is on track is it should not be monopolized by a single organization the way, say, some open source projects are, um, even some of the ones that we really love, right? But I'd prefer to have them not monopolized by a single organization so that there's no in implicit glass ceiling that comes from uh, internal discussions that happen, happen at work that nobody else outside of the org is part of. So uh, that's definitely one thing that I'd like to, like to see, uh, stay, see the project stay on as. Um, I have been extremely horrible at doing promotion of the project and social media work recently because I've been completely swamped at work. So uh, definitely would uh, appreciate volunteers helping with that aspect with, uh, so with social media promotion of the project, helping with documentation, encouraging usage. And of course, um, if there's new data cleaning functions, I think might be cool to other people. I think that's a, that's a great thing that we would love to see inside there. So related to this question um, that you're talking about, not wanting to, to be sort of organization agnostic, maybe, that you're not dominated by a particular mm -hmm. organization, do you have a formalized governance structure? Would that be a place that somebody could help out, uh, um, like, you know, coming up and proposing something? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I am actually not very well versed in this stuff. So sticking as a... Uh, Staying on as BDFL is probably not the long-term thing for me to do. Definitely, like, uh, I think I remember Matt Rocklin's blog post on how to do seven st seven stages of open mm -hmm. source. And uh, the last one is retire <laughs> <laughs> because the project lives on without you, yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> that's a nice That's one. the hope. <laughs> yeah. That's the hope. That's right. So, um, okay, so you talked a little bit about some uh, sort of, you know, places that contributors can come in and help. You know, are there like sort of big new features that it would be help? It would be helpful if somebody wanted to help fund the project or, you know, fund a developer time to work on the project that you can see would be a good avenue for that? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. We have, we have uh, as an unfortunate fragmentation state of the ecosystem data frame 
implementations. I do wish everybody would just settle on one data frame and move with that, mm -hmm. build on top of that. But that's that's not the state we're in right now. So definitely, um, if there's interest in uh, the X-Array, PySpark, and my favorite, Dask data frame, um, porting those over such that they're uh, compatible with those, that would be a great place to, to be. For me, I use Dask, but then uh, I've used Dask, not the data frame part as much because my data hasn't been that big, but I'm pretty sure those who deal with uh, Dask data frames at scale probably might benefit from a few of the data cleaning functions that are available here. Yeah, and that would be like, it would really, I think, change a lot of people's data um, operations also, you know, in industry or in academia, whatever they're um, doing their analysis in, you know, yeah. certainly. Um, yeah, okay, well, this sounds really good. Uh, and lots of cool avenues, again, to contribute. You have new features that would be helpful, documentation, um, things like that. So um, with that, let's switch into uh, our questions, uh, our Q&A section. Um, we have two, uh, and maybe Henry can read the first one. Yes, so what are some of the interesting use cases that you've seen for PyJanitor? Yeah, let's see. Um, interesting use cases, I have to think about that. Hmm. Well, I can, if, if you're okay with this, Henry, I might want to uh, broaden the question a little bit because I can't immediately think of, a, of a, an interesting use case, but I have seen the, the, the package when used by people who are in finance, who are in, so Sam Zuckerman is in finance. So he's contributed a number of finance things. And he actually mm -hmm. also helped with uh, contributing the, if I remember it was him, Valier, one of the two, um, contributed a, a function that allows us to do uh, uh, inflation adjustment of prices so you can adjust some okay. some old historical price into modern times. Uh, that was an interesting one mm -hmm. that I saw. Um, there's I myself have had use cases for in in chemist chemistry, chem informatics, for example. So there is a chem informatics uh, sub module over there, um, and so I use it for chemistry machine learning purposes, like baseline modeling and the likes. So those are those are maybe maybe okay. those are they, maybe those do count as like interesting use cases. I certainly think they sound like that. Awesome. That's for sure. Um, okay, so when I was looking through um, PyJanitor's docs, I noticed you had API documentation for a lot of different domains, like biology and chemistry and machine learning. Are there any mm -hmm. domains that you think um, haven't realized the power of PyJanitor, or like you would like to see? Mm -hmm additions in the API documentation from? Yeah, one thing that I know uh, could be pretty handy is uh, geospatial analysis. Mm. So when you when you have long lat coordinates, you might want to uh, calculate a column that goes like distance to another reference coordinate, for example. And so, you know, rather than re-implement the math every single time for every single user, why not we just put in, put in a function that does something like that. So geospatial analysis is one I think where people might be, might find it handy. In network science, uh, you can represent uh, graphs as an adjacency matrix. So um, an adjacency matrix with attributes for the edge can be uh, represented in basically one data frame. So I'm pretty excited to see whether we can like do automatic, like if you give me a, a data frame I give you one more function that calculates uh, uh, something like, uh, uh, what do you call, centrality metrics mm -hmm. um, without you needing to jump out into network X and then come back into a data frame, mm -hmm. right? Like stuff like that might be, might be pretty handy. I yeah, think. that would be extremely cool. Um, so, okay, so related to actually what you just answered, um, you were talking about like calculating distances and stuff. Do you already have an internal uh, unit handler or would that be a place somebody could contribute? I think that's uh, that's something someone could, could contribute, especially since there are, I think, at least two 
unit handling packages mm -hmm. that are available for the Python world, one being unit and the other being AstroPy, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So definitely like seeing some op interoperability there uh, would be pretty cool. Okay, cool. So another sort of pathway echoing back to our um, yeah. roadmap discussion. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good pun. Yeah. Whoa, okay. whoa. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just making inadvertent puns here just for all of you. Um, okay, so yeah. now we've talked a lot about PyJanitor. Thank you so much, Eric, also for taking the time to sit with Thank us. You. So to round out the episode, let's go into our rant slash rave section where each person gets a 15 second soapbox to rant or rave about whatever topic they uh, feel passionate about this week. Um, so Eric, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, don't touch your face. <laughs> don't touch your face. Do the Corona shake. So bump your elbows. Mm -hmm. And we need more roundabouts to slow traffic in cities. Mm -hmm. That's my rant. I couldn't and I agree with you There are no there are roundabouts everywhere in Australia, and I couldn't believe there are no roundabouts here. <laughs> it's, just, it's just red lights and turn. At least you could turn right at the red light on a red light. That makes a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my rant. I saw. It, I don't know. I shared my experience this morning. It was pretty bad starts this morning, but before the webinar, I looked at my uh, computer battery and I had about 20% and I was like, oh no, went to grab my charger, realized that I left it in the Quantside office yesterday. So oh. I didn't have a mode of transport. So I quickly jumped on the bike, like a little Uber bike and they're pretty fast, these things. I get there, I went to get my um, charger luckily and then was running out a bit of time. I think I had like 10 minutes. So I was like, quickly grab some food from Starbucks. I thought I could manage it in the little bike uh, handle thing at the beginning, like at, at the front, the basket. And I put it, glider up and everything, put two lids on it. And the first little ditch that I go down, it just spurts and goes everywhere. No. All of it. All of it. And it spills all of my croissant. My croissant's now soggy and wet <laughs> with all the coffee. And I'm looking at this coffee like this. I was really needing this and really looking forward to it. Uh, <laughs> So it's just a bad start to the morning. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I rode back with just sticky hands. Okay. I felt bad for it. Yeah, I tried to wipe it down, but it was still sticky. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like this is a good, oh. like, uh, rant about potholes and how they destroy your life. <laughs> it was the tidiest pothole, too. I was so cool. I was like, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, it seems like actually a lot of our uh, oh. discussions today have centered around biking and cars. Uh, so uh, my my rant that I planned before I even knew this was going to happen is um, I get really frustrated when I'm driving and I need to get into a turn lane and the turn lane is only so long and a car slows down because it's a red light and they slow down way before oh. they even get to the light. And so they're just, they're just kind of coasting so they don't have to use their brakes. But then I miss the turn because I can't get in the turn lane and then I have to wait a whole nother cycle because they were just like coasting. Yeah. It, like it's infuriating. I get so angry, and it's like ridiculous. It's only ninety extra seconds, but whatever. Autonomous cars do not come quicker. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Really or I should just like start biking. Like I, it, I mean, bike. but you know. Uh, anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Yeah, bike. Yes, so that's all the time hard. we have for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Open Teams Inc. and Quantsite AI. If you're interested in funding open source projects, including PyJanitor, you can find all the project ro roadmaps at openteams.com slash projects. Eric, where can people find you in PyJanitor? Uh, GitHub. So the links are available in the chat, uh, github.com slash ericmjl, um, and then slash PyJanitor for the repository. And I'm on Twitter under the okay, same username awesome. as well. Cool. So you can uh, also ask your follow-up questions maybe on Twitter if you really have burning pie janitor questions. Join us again next episode where we'll be mm -hmm. booked doing a book-worthy discussion on the novel package Jupiter book. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Have a great, great day.